Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is compiled and produced by the team, biznews.com. A recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. From our team, until the next time, cheerio. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first Business Finance Friday webinar of the year. We're very happy to have Magnus Haystick, one of South Africa's top independent financial advisors, and Lisa Siegel, an expert on global investing, particularly when it comes to funds and ETFs. So welcome, Magnus and Lisa. Thank Thanks you, Jamie. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Thank you. So um, first of all, uh, and also welcome to everybody who's joined us, uh, please start getting your questions coming through on the question box. We've also had some early questions. Uh, before we kick off with getting to some of those questions, Lisa's got some interesting updates to tell us about how global funds are doing. So Lisa, perhaps we could just start by uh, looking at your presentation that you've put together. Sure, thank you, Jackie. Uh, first of all, a surprise to us on the first slide, is that our US equity index fund um, has been the top performer for fund, global funds here in South Africa registered to sell for the last decade. Um, that was a, a article that Patrick Cairns did for MoneyWeb and for um, CityWire. So the top performing fund here in South Africa in the last decade has just been a, an index fund that just tracks the S&P 500. Our fund is actually a little bit broader than that. It's uh, the MSCI US, so it's got 600 stocks, a little bit more representative of the US economy, a little, uh, so it's not just the 500 blue stocks, but a bit of mid and small cap. And then our global equity fund, which I have has been talking about quite a bit on the webinars, also did quite well, it was ranked very high. So that's more broad. Um, so. Thank you. And then you've, you also talk about passive aggressive funds in your presentation. Passive aggressive? No, we only do. Um, you've got passive um, equities, passive bonds? Yes, we've got different types of passive funds. So there's bonds and equities mainly. And you'll see that the um, passive bonds and equities have done very well over the last year, that the, the inflows into a passive type of fund for different. Uh, asset allocations have done increasingly well. So it's not just an equity play for passive, but it's also an equity play, it's also a bond play. And I see on your chart, the active equities have done quite a, a dive into 20, late 2020. Yes, they have. So you see okay. actually the flows are going into index type tracker funds. Thank you. Just for our attendees, uh, Lisa can't see the uh, slides, so we're not yeah. sure what the technical question is. So let's move on to this slide of yours on the Industrial Revolution, which is really interesting. And we've had a lot of early questions on some of the issues that you touch on in this uh, slide, particularly blockchain. Uh, so you mentioned here uh, genomics, blockchain, cloud computing. Your chart looks very uh, similar to a chart put out by Kathy Wood, who's the rock star fund manager of the moment in the US with the ARC uh, technology Yes, fund. she's done very, very to well. But, out what yeah. do you see here? Okay, so this is actually, I think, Jackie, one of the questions was, um, what was the sweetener for in our funds last year? The ETFs was, it's called a mega trend, equally weighted fund. Um, the ticket symbol, if you look on the stock exchange is ITEK, I-T-E-K. Um, we like this fund because it actually is exposed to the fourth industrial revolution. It's not necessarily new companies or companies that are startups. It's actually traditionally uh, companies that people, well-known companies that people know who are embracing the industrial revolution to bring their products and um, technology um, more efficiently to the market and to make their costs cheaper. So this fund has got eight sub themes and under each sub theme, there's about uh, 15 companies in each. What's nice about this fund is that it's um, equally weighted across the sub themes and the stock. So 
not many companies are more than 1%. So for people who are worried about tech um, and the tech bubble and obviously the fangs, this would still be um, a tech theme, but wouldn't have, you would be more um, cautious on uh, with going with this fund because you don't have seven stocks representing over 50% of the NASDAQ. So this is a much more diversified, uh, less risky way of getting a tech play. Interesting. And you've got blockchain there as well. I'm, I'm sure we'll pick so, up on that. Yes. Yeah, so blockchain yeah. is a new sub theme that we've added and there are two companies have qualified because it's quite a rigorous qualification. You've got to have over a hundred million market cap on that. So the two ones actually, the blockchain has contributed those two companies 650% return for the year. I'm scared of big numbers. <laughs> is that right? Blockchain and NEO? No. NEO is the equivalent of Tesla in China. It's not. It's called, it's actually a German company called Northern Data. So okay. the two okay. companies so that are in the top 10 index holdings then? No, no. So the two companies that have qualified, because it's small. The two companies that qualified are support for the blockchain. So they're not exactly involved in the Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency. It's more the infrastructure and the admin surrounding blockchain. Okay. Before we move on here, I see in your uh, sector list, you've got genomics as well. I see that Cathy Wood is very uh, optimistic about uh, genomics as a, a trend for the next year or two to underpin investment yes. ideas. Correct. And it's also, uh, genomics is also one of the themes in our healthcare. It's called Well. So it is a theme to incorporate. What's an interesting slide. Oh, sorry, Jackie. Yeah, no, please continue. Uh, I think just given on those trends that you're talking up, you're talking like blockchain genomics, the slide that you should actually look at is slide six, which shows diversification power of this particular ETF. So you can see in different years, different sub themes have been number one. So why we like the ITEC play um, is because you don't, it's got all the sub themes. So you don't necessarily have to choose cybersecurity or health tech or um, robotics, particularly it covers the broad spectrum of this new industrial revolution. So if you look where ITEC has performed, it's the dark green for 2000, it's, it's actually the second best performer overall in terms of the different sub themes because it incorporates them all. So that's actually a very powerful slide. It shows the power of diversification. Okay. And um, then you've got this diversification power slide as well. Is that what you're talking about here? Correct. With your yes. sharp ratios and things. Okay. Yes. So these slides will be available later if people want to look at, uh, pick up on the webinar, they'll be able to see your slides in the YouTube channel, business YouTube channel. And then you've also got a slide here, global short-term EV share of new passenger vehicle sales by region. Uh, and then you're yes. looking at China, Europe, US. Does this come back to your NEO pick? The NEO and Tesla. Okay. Actually, because they're both one of the holdings in the Arctic. So I don't know if people listen to Biden and what is one of his fundamentals that he wants to uh, concentrate on going forward is obviously clean in energy. He's going to be a big spend on that and electric vehicles. He hopes by 2023, most you'll see EV vehicles as opposed to petrol or diesel gas guzzling stuff. So um, Tesla and the equivalent in China is Neo. So that's just the long-term growth for that. And then just talking about China, it can be quite challenging to access those bigger companies in China, can't it? So maybe the fund is the route to go. Correct, because actually the fund now is about 57% in the US, just under 30% in Asia specific, and you've got in the rest in Europe. So this fund is a global play. It's not just a US play, which, which we like. Okay. Okay, great. And then just looking at your next slide, US social network ad spending. What what do you want yes. to tell us about this and how does this feed into a portfolio? Well, that's one of the social media. It's one of the sub themes and it's just showing how it's increased over the COVID work from home phenomena. So you've got actually, which is quite interesting in, <laughs> it's quite a nice name, Billy Billy, which is the equivalent of a YouTube 
in China, which has seen phenomenal growth in that market. And it's just showing you that um, social media is a big play. Netflix as well, in terms of digital inter entertainment. So that's been a huge growth market. And how do you pick your trends? How, how do you decide uh, which companies to focus on? Because social media could be quite risky now, couldn't it? There seems to be a bit of a chilly wind blowing through the regulatory authorities when we look at Facebook and Instagram. Yes, well, you're actually referring to, there's a section on the Communications Act in the US, Section 230, which um, Facebook has actually been immune against, which is they're, they're not being um, taken to task or being prosecuted for nefarious content, you know. So that might be what Biden would focus on in terms of bringing those social media, Facebook to task. So the social media, as I said before, our tech, you have uh, eight sub themes and 15 stocks underneath most of them. And it's only a 1% maximum exposure on each of those themes. So if social media does take a knock, it's not going to affect this particular ETF that much. Okay. And then as, as we move towards the end of your slides, you mentioned the digital health market. Perhaps you could just briefly tell us what we should read into that. This is actually quite an interesting play, the digital health market. It's also one of Biden's tenants for his presidency. He wants to improve the health play in America because there's a, it's not very equal amongst the haves and the have-nots. So um, he's going to unleash quite a big spending uh, on health in the States. Um, we see telemedicine, which is virtual consultations, going to be hugely more used. Um, so actually quite interesting. So if you were going to go for a cataract op, the first point of call would actually be scanning it through a computer before they decide whether you need an op or not. So we see the, the our well, which is our um, our healthcare index going to actually grow, and I see a good performance on that in terms of genomics, telemedicine. Um, that's going to be a big growth and a big spend by the Biden pres presidency. And then finally, Amazon leads a $100 billion cloud market. Our, uh, Amazon is quite an expensive share at this stage. Do you still see that it's a good opportunity and this sort of general space is a good place for people to be invested in? Well, actually, Amazon is actually quite interested in the healthcare as well. They just bought a very big pharmacy chain in America. So they're going to actually move into digital health. Um, the reason, as I said, again, we don't... Um, in our art tech, Amazon would only be 1% because it's equally weighted. Okay. So you're not going to have the risk that you would have buying a fund that tracks the NASDAQ. Okay. Because the, the seven top, the fangs are, make about 7%, make over 50%. The seven, those fangs shares make over 50% of the NASDAQ. So if you're worried about tech and that's in a bubble, but you still want exposure to it, I think our art tech is the play. Thank you, Lisa. Magnus, perhaps we can um, talk to you now about for, for your views on uh, the broad themes that Lisa has just uh, focused on. I know you've been uh, quite I interested in uh, the development of vaccines, for example, and your, cl your clients have been invested in the Signia Fund that has access to the vaccines. Perhaps you could just pick up on some of these themes and whether you agree or disagree with Lisa. You know, Jackie, if I go back 10 years, we started looking at things like biotech and tech and, and those kind of funds and started writing about it on MoneyWeb. And I've been a great proponent of including a portion in those tech funds, the tech mega trend. And, but there was a massive, massive blowback from the local investment community, um, almost a kind of a jealousy. And, and, and whenever I wrote about tech or biotech, they would say, no, you, that's risky advice, that's dangerous, blah, 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 with the result that I would say 95, 98 or 99% of South African ma mainstream investors have by and large missed one of the largest uh, mega trends in the world, with the exception of having a small ex exposure in, in Tencent or Mayo or, or Nostras. And that comes down to an institutional bias. 
in, in advising or recommending the products that you have at your disposal and shooting down the stuff that you don't have. And I've seen it in so many, many reports over so many years where you get up and, and you listen to the fund managers forever telling now is the time to buy the market, our market is cheap, re revert to mean. In fact, just last night I was involved on Twitter with a local fund manager from PSG who was saying, now is the time to buy South Africa. This is the turning point and get out of the expensive tech stocks. And if you, if you truly understand what's happening in the world, that is so laughable. If you look at the wealth that has been created, uh, the innovation by tech stocks in a wide range of applications, stuff that Lisa has mentioned that's been going on for many years, which in my view has been accelerated by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic of last year, where you don't have to make money in bricks and mortars and factories and actual products, but you make money in the, the data, the, the, the analytical work, the disruption that it brings. So it's very, very sad that most South Africans have actually missed this boom. They're sitting with returns of between four and 5%, where the tech stocks have given you 30, 40, 50%. I mean, I, I mentioned um, yesterday to somebody, my, my pension fund in my living annuity has done 62% last year because it's 100% into the fourth industrial revolution funds that, that, that Lisa is selling. It's working, it's a mega theme, and, and, and is it gonna come crashing down on my head? I don't think so. It's just too big a theme Tech has overtaken our world. We cannot survive as a modern society today without tech, to put it quite bluntly. And if you're not invested in that, you're getting the wrong advice or you're getting advice from local fund managers who have a vested interest to protect, and that is the local stuff, which is simply just not growing. In, in fact, if you strip out NOSPAS over the last 10 years from the JSC, um, our JSC has declined by 8% per year. It has declined. And with the results, you've got millions of people heading towards retirement with underfunded pension funds. They, they, their portfolios are not growing, but yet week after week you read, now is the time to buy the JSC. I simply cannot, I cannot support that view. I think it is so, so uh, self-serving and irresponsible and, 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 and people are, are pulling their money out. I see the outflows from the Alan Grays and the coronations are horrendous. The people are not making their own decisions. They simply had enough of this. Oh, it will come right. It will come right. Uh, and it's simply not coming right. Yes. One of my colleagues, Justin Rowe Roberts, wrote a piece today reminding us how many companies have delisted from the JSC mm. over the past 10 years. And the trend just seems to continue. We need some sort of catalyst, I guess, to get people interested in the JSC again. Do you think that's going to happen anytime soon? I just don't see it. You know, it all comes down from politics, the macroeconomic situation. Um, capital is, is, is flowing out of South Africa on a massive scale. The foreigners don't see it as a place to raise capital and to, to list anything of significance. It's, we, are, we, are, we are and have missed the boat in terms of new listings. It's just not happening. But we have our fund managers who keep on saying, I don't worry, it'll revert to mean. And I, I, that is the biggest lie in my in the investment business right now. Hmm. Lisa, before we take the first question, do any of your funds have any exposure to South Africa? Um, in the emerging markets, we've got a small, we've got a MECI emerging markets, so South Africa would be small. And our bond fund used to have it, but I think South Africa's been downgraded on the bond, so no. Okay. And Are definitely not on the ETFs. Sorry? Okay. No, we don't. You're well, the funds. Confusing. No, because no, the funds are um, basically, they are index dominant. Um, that's their play. So they do whatever the index has, the fund has, it mirrors the index. So on an MSCI uh, world, there's no, there's no, maybe there's only pros, um, the two funds that are, have a, a dual listing here, but no. 10 cent okay. NASPERS, but those are the two companies, but that's it. Thank you. Pete Lowe has a question for both of you. He says, what is the panel's view on the US dollar given the trillions being printed for COVID? Right, uh, 
I can't read, sorry, the note properly, but basically, given the trillions being printed for COVID-related stimulus of the economy, uh, and he says this is also happening worldwide, will, is this cause for concern for the US dollar? So in a nutshell, what is your view on how currencies are likely to unfold over the next year? Magnus, would you like to put, look into your crystal ball? You know, if you look at the amount of money that the US Fed has, has created and printed in the last year or three, but especially last year, they have increased their balance sheet by 60%. So there's a lot of dollars floating around the world. So there's no surprise that the dollar is gently floating downwards towards uh, against all currencies, including the South African um, um, uh, rond. But that's only half the story. It is making certain asset classes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And a lot of people only look at the RAND dollar exchange rate when they look at onshore, offshore, it's almost like a binary thing. In fact, if we've done an analysis, if you took money out on the worst day last year when the rand was at 1920 uh, against the dollar and you invested it in a range of the high tech funds or, or other funds, healthcare funds, demographic funds, despite the strengthening of the rand, you still have made positive returns mm. because the growth has been faster than the decline in the currency. So looking at the rand dollar exchange rate is only looking at one side of the coin. You've got to look at the other side as well. So yes, it, it can go lower and probably will go lower, but it's actually good for, for, for equity markets because there's nothing much else on at the stage. Bonds are at yield or at zero. There might be an oil and a gold play somewhere, but it still is. The momentum is still in these mega trends and we've been talking about them on this webinar for, uh, for a year or two now, and I don't see any reason to change. Lisa, do you look at that rand much in your um, office? I think, you know, people shouldn't actually, you should always look at the dollar because the dollar dictates mm. the rand performance. That's where I think people, they think, okay, there's a political statement, the rand weakens, but it's actually all linked. You should all follow the dollar, not the rand. What the dollar does impacts on the rand's uh, re uh, volatility and the return. And I think that they want the dollar to be weak because they want to go back to exporting a lot more American product. So sometimes it does benefit that particular the, the states to have a weaker currency. Thank you. Ravindra says this question is for Magnus. What is your view on commodities, especially silver? You know, commodities is a big is a, is a big play, and commodities have benefited last year from from um, and and still is benefiting from you know emerging markets picking up, and particularly China. The China activity is driving the demand for commodities, so we are benefiting, and, and we are still a big player there. But but silver is not a commodity; it's part of the precious metals. And for 40 years, I've been in the investment world. And for 40 years, people have been saying solar is the next big one. The next big one is solar. And for 40 years, I've been saying, um, I don't know, I don't think so. And especially for South Africans, very difficult to buy silver on any exchange. It's not a big thing. I'm not aware of any silver ETFs on any of the local markets. So you probably will have to go to the offshore markets to go and buy silver products but it, it's not a big it's not a big thing uh, uh, in I'm my not sure view. we've lost magnus there no jacks magnus is still coming through eh? all good um hmm. all right everyone's saying sorry yeah yeah, I, I would, I would, be, yeah, I wouldn't look at silver as a big play. I think gold. I mean, people must remember gold last year had a fantastic run in the first half. People made a lot of money. It hasn't done much since then. I would, I would rather be buying gold at these levels than than silver. Silver has just always been such a peripheral play, hanging onto the coattails of gold and platinum. Uh, I just, it just doesn't excite me. Thanks, Magnus. I'm not sure, Jacks, are you back? I think Jax has lost us. I mean, yeah. that's fine, Max. I've got some questions there, not to worry. Um, there's a question from EJ. He says Signia has restricted offshore investments for living annuities and, and endowments to 30% for now. We are encouraged to invest offshore. Is this the norm again amongst other investment managers? I'm not sure if Lisa or Magnus can answer that. 
No, I can answer that because it's probably my fault that they've had to restrict <laughs> that. Um, all investment companies bump up against that um, exchange control regulatory issue that you may not have th more than 30% of your total assets in offshore um, in investment instruments. And as a result of the flow of money into the Signia offshore products, plus the growth in those instruments, they have now breached that 30% temporarily, and it will open up the minute they can get more flows on the other parts of their business, the money market funds, the bond funds, the equity funds. So that is very unfortunate. It's very temporary, but it has applied to all the investment companies. Alan Gray had to do it a couple of years ago. Um, Sunlam Glacier, they all have to do it with 30%, 50%. But that's a regulatory issue. It's not Signia's problem. It's the Reserve Bank and the exchange controls that kicks in and then they are forced by, by, by decree to reduce their offshore exposure until they get inflows on their local assets, which I think it'll be quite soon. Thanks, Magnus. Jax, you back? Yes, I'm back. Sorry about that. Magnus, perhaps we could follow up as well on that 30% and that exchange control circular. Um, we know that the, the um, SARP was taking in comments. Do you have any update on that? Do you think that will be changed? Well, obviously, you know, the, I mean, business got involved into that story big time and, and, and effectively um, created such a confusion and a pushback from the large investment companies that the FSCA actually stepped in and forced the Reserve Bank and, and the um, Treasury to retract that circular. There were submissions from many, many parties concerned, including myself. And, and I'm quite sure Signia and everybody else. And there was an undertaking that we'll get clarity on this in the budget uh, later this, in the later next month, middle of the month. So I, I'm expecting some alleviation, but not 100% offshore. That that was the practical implication of the circular when it when it was launched. Uh, so that we will know about in a month's time. Thank you. Here's a question for Lisa. Uh, you wanted to know how do you invest in that ETF that you mentioned earlier for the iTech one? Uh, can it be traded on WebTrader? And this ties in with another question from Jenna, which arrived on emails, wanting to know how do you invest in these funds? So are they traded? Do you have to come to to go through an advisor? Lisa, perhaps you could just spell out the steps for somebody who's investing offshore and anyone wants to invest in one of these funds for the first time. Sure. So the ETF is a, is a share. It's different to an index fund, which is a mutual fund. So an ETF is traded on exchange. We've got, it's traded on four bourses overseas. The main one for South Africa is probably the easiest is the LSE, the London Stock Exchange. Um, you can either come direct to us. We actually using Investec on the, on the um, back end to do the trading for us. Or you can use, there's a various, um, stockbroking firms here who would be able to buy the ETFs or I don't know if someone knows DMA which is the old Saxo bank they trade our ETFs so does Rand Swiss, um, Credo, um, I think Easy Equities and Mexum so most of the stockbroking or the platforms here who trade ETFs or shares would be able to go and buy those ETFs it's actually a simple um, method to do. Thank you. Um, and here's another question from a different Peter, uh, probably for Magnus. Currently, I have a, a living annuity at Allen Gray. What advantages are there to move? Will it cost me money to move? So the logistics of you're unhappy with it. Is it easy to move and are there costs? You know, you want, one should remember that Allen Gray, like all of the other platforms, is simply just a platform where they have a range of funds that you or your advisor can choose from. The unhappy part should come on the advice that you're given. And, and that probably is because the platforms are not allowed to give advice. It's either yourself or your advisor who constructs these portfolios. It's very rare that a platform will cause enough problems for you to take it away if you decide to do so. The one area where you might decide is if, if a platform restricts 
your your choice of funds. And sometimes people say the Ellen Gray choice of funds is very restrictive. Then you want to get into these innovative funds and you want to move it somewhere else, either to Momentum or to Signia. It's, it's a paper heavy uh, a task, but it can be done. It doesn't cost you money. It's just an, uh, quite a lot of paperwork. And we do it all the time. When people are not happy or the advisor, we will move it to a platform where we can get the best rates and fees for our clients. So it's quite easily done, but mostly it's about the choice of funds rather than anything else on the platform. Thank you. And uh, here's another question on uh, Platinum. Uh, Chris wants to know if you bought Platinum, surely your returns would have mirrored tech. So um, not sure who would like to take this one, Magnus or Lisa. Lisa, have you got any views on that, choosing between? Yeah, plat Platinum, uh, sorry, Lisa. Platinum no, was, was, was... Okay, Magnus? Platinum was was the absolute star on the JSC last year. In fact, uh, apart from uh, the, the gold, it was essentially um, platinum and gold and the NOSPLAS last year that drove our market. So if, but remember, platinum is very, very volatile and it's got very, many more variables, but platinum has been a good place to be as a speculative play for speculative investors. I'm looking for areas in the market where you can invest by your you know, your pension fund or your living annuity, which gives you greater exposure to global mega trends. But platinum has been a good place to be, but with very high volatility. Thank you. Uh, Jared wants to know, with all this talk about NASPERS, Magnus, would you invest in NASPERS? Would that be an exception in terms of your view on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange shares? Well, if you, if you tongue in cheek, do a simple exercise the last 10 years, if you had a million rand to invest 10 years ago and you put 30% into NOSPAS and 70% into cash, you had a phenomenal return with very, very low risk, beating everything else on our market. So it, it's been a NOSPAS market for 10, maybe even 20 years, and it's driven by tech. Uh, it's one of the best investments in the world. I think, of course, Becker paid $31 million 20 years ago for that stake in 10 cent, and that's worth one and a half trillion rand now. So NASPERS is, uh, and, and of course the process part is, is a place where I will put money and I have put money. Thank you. Uh, here's another question for Magnus. If I want to put 20% of my offshore portfolio into an inflation hedge, what would you recommend? A commodities ETF maybe? My total portfolio is only ETFs. Well, inflation hedge is, are you talking about the South African inflation or the global inflation? You know, it all depends on returns. I still like, and I've been, I've been beating this drum, you know, the COVID has shown that you have to have exposure to healthcare, uh, biotech, anything in that space, because people have realized how important health is. They will pay a premium for anything that will prevent you becoming sick. And if you are sick, they'll pay another premium to get you better. So a great chunk of my personal money for 10 years, I've been telling people, you can go to something like the Franklin Templeton uh, Biotech Fund, which we uh, put on the Momentum platform 10 years ago. I think the returns there have been 1,000% in 10 years. I would still put some money into that. Or if you don't want such a concentrated risk, um, you can put it into a, glo a more global tech fund or, or if you want really, really uh, high risky, but potentially very attractive returns, I will take that money offshore and put it onto one of the platforms into one of the global um, funds that, that, that Lisa has been talking about. And, and it's, been a great, it's been a great place to be. That's still the best hedge is an offshore hedge in a global mega trend. And that could be health, healthcare, health technology, uh, that's where I put my money. Thank you. Before we move on, this Cathy Wood Fund, what do you think about that, Magnus? Would you put your money in there or do you think it's too hot and frothy now? You know, first of all, I don't know how to get, people have been asking me, how do we get access to a fund, the ARK, the ARK fund? <clears throat> Secondly, I couldn't find out and I suspect if I do, they're going to have very large minimums which will exclude most South Africans. I don't know if Lisa knows. But if you read what she's been doing, She's just been doing what we've been talking about in a peripheral way. 
innovative medical companies, genomic companies, gene splitting, all the kind of stuff that we've been talking about. She's just done it much better than everybody else. And she has just, um, you know, hit the market with her spectacular returns. So, I mean, but she's in the space or has been about the instruments and the, in the investment areas that we've been talking about. You can get exposure to similar places, much cheaper funds, and you can do it in RANDs in, from South Africa. But I suspect if you can get into ARC, you're going to probably have a minimum of a million dollars or something because she's just taken so much money. At some point, she's going to close the gates. Um, that fund has actually only it's actually only seen a lot of flows in the last year or two, Magnus. If you actually Correct, yeah. She was always yeah. under the radar. I actually did a research on it yesterday. Um, and, her, and, the, and the holding of the stocks are small. It's like 20, I don't think there's more than 40 stocks there, 20 to 40. So that's a risky play. You know, we've got the same funds and the same stocks in our, the Arctic and the well, but obviously we got a far broader offering. And also for South Africans, I don't know where the domicile of that fund is. So it's mainly probably only for US investors, it might be domiciled in the US, and then you've got inheritance tax issue. The situs of the fund might be an issue for South Africa. So um, she's been around for a long time. She's only seen spectacular returns in the last two years. Interesting. Well, we have a number of attendees who mm. are going to tell us where you can invest in ARC. And uh, Seamus and Raymond say that you can invest in uh, ARC ETFs through Easy Equities. And Fred says he's been investing in the ARC ETFs through the old Saxo, which I think you referred to earlier, Lisa. That's DMA. And there are Correct. No, no minimums, he says. Mm. And Harshad also says you can buy ARC funds via Ameritrade. Um, and somebody wants to now know about Bitcoins, good or bad idea to be investing, or maybe the word investing is um, maybe, maybe to be trading in Bitcoins. Magnus, are you getting a lot of questions about Bitcoins? Gregory wants to know what your view is on Bitcoins. Sorry, what's that? I can't hear. It's a bad line. It's a bad line. <laughs> There's your answer, Gregory. Lisa, I, 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 tend to be, I tend to be in the Warren Buffett camp. Who says it's it's not a it's not a currency it's not an investment. If you want to invest in it, it's like collecting tulips. The price might go up, and a lot of people might make might make money going up. But um, I just don't understand it. You know, I know everybody's now talking about Bitcoin and the banks are going to come with products. I still want someone to explain it to me in three minutes, and I can't get someone to do it in three minutes. I'm actually with um, Magnus on that point. Uh, if I can't understand something, I won't uh, sell it. However, there is, as I said to you, in our art tech, there's a blockchain theme, which is the support, the, the administration behind your Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So for me, that would be a less risky play in the Bitcoin arena. So it doesn't depend on the performance of the Bitcoin. It just depends on the volume and the trading of it. So, you know, Bitcoin can get 20% up one day and then the next day you can get 30% 30, 30 uh, uh, can be negative. So the actual blockchain, which is the support for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, wouldn't be as volatile because it just depends on the trading. It doesn't depend on the return of that particular currency. So I would look at blockchain as a more of a diversified, less risky play than the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency itself. Magnus, do you have anything to add to that blockchain as a, a technology that uh, central banks are looking at and companies are looking at? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Put it 5% in your portfolio like you've got with one of Lisa's ETS, but to go, you know, I, I'm reminded about five, six years ago when the, 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 the wild game market in SA was going absolutely crazy, especially in the Afrikaans community. You have people paying 30 million, 20 million rand for buffaloes on the basis that, you know, it's, it's shortages and bloodlines. And and I made some comments about it on radio and I actually went to one of these auctions and they nearly beat me up because I didn't agree with these people. I said, what is the ultimate use of this buffalo that you're going to be buying and spending 20 million rand to buy one bull? And start breeding and all the other costs and and the ultimate 
the, the, the answer was ultimately to breed more of these things. And I said, but then the, the demand is going it's, it's to be overtaken by supply and the price will come down. And I wish it's, it has done spectacularly in the last five or six years. Nobody talks about the big crash in the buffalo market in South Africa. I still don't know what is the ultimate aim of a Bitcoin. Is it, is it the store of wealth? Is it a tradable commodity? Is it something that I can exchange for land or food? And I still have my mental doubts. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm old school. I would rather put it in a fund where it's part of the technology and you benefit from the people who make the, 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 the instrumentation to, to, to mine Bitcoins rather than the Bitcoins themselves. Hmm. I totally Thank concur you. with Magnus on that. Totally. Do you want to elaborate why? No, well, I said to him, it's, it's also, as you know, what's the underlying value? What is the asset? It's, it's um, our, you know, our philosophy at, at Gens Global, and obviously we do index funds, is steady eddy. It's, it's, we're not there to shoot the lights out. We're not there on fads. You know, we try and um, our main play is diversification and minimizing risk and volatility. And I think if it's too good to be true, it's too good, for too, too good to be true. You know, you've had a few... South African companies lately in the press, the MTI, that cryptocurrency, and I think there was a Forex um, blow up recently as well. You know, for long-term money, for money that's there for your, you know, for your retirement or your legacy for your kids, I think these fads, you might as well go to the gambling casino. <laughs> we much more diversification, steady eddy, uh, and there's substance and value add behind it. What sort of percentage return should alarm bells start ringing at? Because we've seen some, as you mentioned, Tesla and all these FANG stocks, and, and these seem to be still flying, and Amazon was doing really well. But what about in broad brushstrokes? When should you be thinking, well, if it's too good to be true, it is? Magnus, what's the percentage? Is there a rule of thumb? Well, there's no rule of thumb. But I, I, you know, coming back to Lisa's comment about this currency, guys, I mean, these guys came to me about two weeks, two months, uh, sorry, two years ago. The Presidium guys, they wanted to offer it to our clients. And you start scratching, you start analyzing. They were offering something like 5 to 10% per month. I mean, it was just outrageous. And you start asking questions and how do you do it? No, we can't tell you. It's our secret trading algorithm, which is now the new thing. We have an algorithm that's so smart. And I went through there. I couldn't find the substance. I couldn't find where the money was. I said to be able okay, to, 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 to listen, just stay away from these guys. I wouldn't put anything in it. And of course, just before Christmas, they went belly up and there's a billion rand missing. And then everybody turns around and says, well, why didn't someone do something? Well, a lot of people did something. They warned them, but people are sometimes so gullible, so greedy. And I think in one of the cases, there's someone who put in 100 million rand into this proscenium because it was making 50% a year, if not more. That is just stupidity. And, you know, if you, to answer your question, if you're in a country where there's inflation of 10 and you have inflation plus eight or 10, that's still acceptable in a good market, companies can do that. But if someone comes along and gives you five times the inflation rate, in a conventional investment instrument, you simply say it doesn't work, it cannot work, stay away. And over time, that has just been, you know, a, a very good guidelines. Thank you. Tucker Zani has a follow-up question for Lisa on NEO. Uh, good day. Is NEO a good long-term investment? What is the investment case? So I guess thinking about Tesla, maybe it's too late to get into a Tesla. Is this the next Tesla? And perhaps you could just reflect on and remind us which fund people could be investing in if they want to, um, you know, take advantage of these ideas on NEO. Uh, NEO is one of the holdings in the ITEC, the digital revolution, the mega trend equally weight. So it is one of the underlying stocks. So that's the obviously the Chinese Tesla. I don't, you know, as I said before, we believe in the power of diversification, less risk, less volatility. So if you want to have exposure, um, maybe put in a percentage into the ITEC as, the, as your base, your foundation, 
for you, that particular exposure. And if you like it and you believe it's a good play, you can always then buy the stock to add to that particular fund. But as I said, we don't make a play on any particular stock or um, I, I, that wouldn't be what I would advise. We believe in more board-based diversification and a more um, based on the theme. So the theme for NEO would fit into uh, digital industrialization, the fourth industrial, industrial play. Thank you. Magnus, do you have anything to add to that? Sorry, I was interrupted. I didn't hear the right, the first part of it's the question. Okay. So, mm. so Takadzani wants to know about whether investing in NEO is a good idea, and if so, how to invest in it. So uh, we're, we're discussing NEO and Yeah, Tesla. no, okay. that I, that I, I, I agree. I mean, it's so risky selecting one stock mm. and then I put a lot of money into it. That doesn't work over time. And you normally only have survivor bias. You only have the guys who survive and not lost all their money who talk about how much money they've made in a certain stock. I like the fund approach or an, 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 an index fund where that takes care of it. So to, to just to go and pick one stock, you know, I get asked often, give me a tip. I've, I've stopped giving tips years ago because your chances of being wrong is so high. And, and, and people only remember when you're wrong and forget when you're right. And you've been right a lot, Magnus, and, and they, they still don't seem to remember. I've been wrong. I've been wrong a lot of times too, but I'm slightly ahead in the right and wrong game. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I've been spectacularly wrong at my own cost and paid the price. And I've, I've learned my lessons. You don't. It's not investing is not gambling. And if you go for one stock and put all your savings in one share, it might come off, but the chances are you're going to get burnt. Thank you. We've got time for one more question, and this one seems like a good one from Averill. Uh, she wants to know, how do you think COVID will affect offshore investments in the next few years? So it would be a good time to perhaps, Lisa, just set out what your view is for the year. And if, if you're investing, what do you suggest? What would your best investment idea be for 2021? Thanks for the question. No, no. It's actually a, it's a good question. Um, we actually think COVID has just accelerated with uh, the the digital revolution and the fourth industrial revolution quicker. So something like, especially in the healthcare, that would have taken five years is taking 10 months. So we think COVID has just accelerated fast adoption of these companies. And it's like in genomics, telemedicine, it's just come to the play and to the fore much quicker than it would have been. And we see a lot of spending in those areas, especially by the Biden presidency. Um, in healthcare, I think healthcare is a good, or I don't like to give tips, but it would be something that you should have exposure to in your portfolio. Uh, maybe it depends on how you build your portfolio, but it should be a 5% or 5% to 10% allocation. And I definitely would have the uh, mega trend equally weighted uh, ETF in that, which is the fourth industrial revolution it's a tech play but it's come with substantial companies it's companies that have been around for a long time that has just been embracing using technology to make um, their products faster more efficient and, and better value and better cost um i still also like our index fund which is the global equity i've been saying that for quite a while now as the foundation of a portfolio it's 1600 stocks What's nice about it is it's a global play, so you're not taking a bet on the US market or Europe, Europe or Asia. Um, you've got basically on just 23 developed markets. And the Artec is also a global play, so that dovetails quite nicely with the global equity. It's, so you've got 60% in the Artec in the US, you've got Asia Pacific, and you've got a bit of Europe as well. So definitely healthcare and fourth industrial revolution themes are a good play. I would see that a lot of money spent there um, in 2021. So COVID's just accelerated those themes. Thank you. Magnus, what are your but views on how COVID is going to affect uh, the investment well, world? I, mean, I think these are summed it up 100%. As I 100% agree. COVID has just accelerated, compressed. And, you know, investment success is sometimes determined by the investments that you make and also sometimes the investments that you don't make. 
And I think certain sectors to be avoided are global property, accommodation, travel, uh, uh, leisure, cruise line shipping, all those things, the so-called beach stocks, bookings.com, Carnival Cruises, air, airlines, those sectors will remain depressed for a long time or until we have clarity on the virus and whether there's a cure or not. So stay away from those things for the time being. The time for recovery will be a little bit later. I will stick with my technology, biotechnology, healthcare, and lastly, demographic trends. Uh, I'm talking about the baby boomers. Those are the guys with the largest amounts of money to spend. And that's been a very nice demographic trend that we've been following at Brentus. And the returns have been 15% per annum over 10 years in US dollars. And I don't see any reason to venture out of that space. So very much the same as the last five to 10 years in technology, healthcare, demographics. And how much of your money would you have in South Africa, or would you take it all and <coughs> spread it offshore? Now, look, for, for, let me let me just put it into context. South African bonds of cash have been a great place to be, and a lot of our clients' money is in South Africa in bonds of cash, giving them the base for income and predictability. But the long-term growth has been offshore. It's not been in South Africa. And so from an equity perspective, very little will be in South Africa but the balance will be in South Africa in cash and bonds. And also lastly, staying out of the local property market. The market, the commercial market is under severe pressure, not reported accurately. So I'll also stay away from property. But bonds and cash for the high income fund space still is a great place to be, although you're getting 6%, 7%. That is still double the inflation rate. So equities for long-term growth, SA cash and bonds for stability in your portfolio. Thank you very much, Magnus, for those ideas. And thank you very much, Lisa. So thank you to both of you for joining us and also to everybody who joined the webinar. If you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to send them to me. And yeah, we hope to see you this time next week. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Jesse. Jesse. Thank, thank you. you Thanks, Magnus. Enjoy, enjoy the beautiful weather in the Cape. We are. We are. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. A recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. From our team, until the next time, cheerio. I'm <laughs> sorry.